there everyone it's dina and i'm here with another guest today and i hope you are enjoying our event for the save a life challenge and i'm here with jeanette pizarro harp and we are going to talk about the subject of military sexual trauma so jeanette i'm going to let you introduce yourself in that subject a little more in detail sure. welcome well thank you thank you diana for having me um well I served in the Marine Corps for a little over six years. Um, and unfortunately, while I served active duty, um, I experienced military sexual assault and harassment. And um, for many years, I was ashamed of it. Um, so I didn't want to talk about it. But um, recently I've been seeing on the news how um, this is happening even more um, and it, it really saddens me. So um, it pushed me to decide that it's important to talk about. And so that's why now I decided to come out and speak and um, use my voice and, and you know, let everyone know. Um, I think it's important for people to understand um, what exactly military sexual trauma is. Um, and so People need to know that it's uh, forced or coerced sexual encounters. Um, it is also um, repeated sexual advances. Um, it's inappropriate sexual jokes. Um, and it's also rape. Um, and so that, that kind of is what we want to talk about today. Yeah. I think what um, maybe where we could start, Jeanette, is what we were saying about the difference between civilian life and military life and how how there's a difference in this arena. Right. right. OK. Um, I, statistically, um, I found um, in my research that, um, unfortunately, this happens for um, the, the Department of Veterans Affairs is now collecting data. And so when we are discharged, um, the ones that do go into the VA, that there are questionnaires that they ask. And um, they're, right now they're saying that one in four women have experienced some form of sexual trauma that will include harassment, assault. Um, and, and so that's a sad statistic. Um, there is a, a significant difference between um, women that experience sexual assault um, in civilian life and s women that experience it in the military. And it's um, not to diminish civilian experience at all, but um, unfortunately, when you're in the military, you sometimes and often are living in a confined space. and it becomes a tight knit community and where everyone lives and works together. And you will see and encounter these people on a regular basis, you know, daily. Um, and so when, um, when, when it happens to a woman in the military, it becomes even worse because often the person, the assailant is the person that is either her superior or someone that she works with. And so it's a repeated offense to a woman because we have to see this person every day. And you have a fear of reporting it because a lot of times, you know, in the military, we have this thing where you're supposed to protect, you know, your, your troops. And mm -hmm. so if you speak up about someone, you're the bad guy. And it doesn't really matter what the subject is that you're speaking up about, you end up, it ends up being turned on you. And so women have to deal with that because it's not even about the sexual assault. That won't be the focus. It's the focus of that you have betrayed the trust of the unit. Mm -hmm. And so all those things are indoctrinated into our minds. So when we experience sexual, sexual assault or harassment, all these things play in our mind because we don't want to look a certain way or we don't want to be um, have people whispering about, oh, she's the one who told on him and he was such a nice guy. 
because they didn't they they didn't experience it um and then especially when it's a person that is your superior you have to report to this person and this person is the one who has done this harm to you um so that's the sad part and the and the big difference between a civilian um experience and and the military one sure i'm sure there's instances um I don't know the data on this subject, but I'm sure there's instances where there are people in even corporate positions who are dealing with similar things with a superior. I mean, I, I think it's still still different because you're not living together and, and right. you know, you're not, you know, expected to have each other's back on a level that you you have in the military. But um, I'm sure there's uh, there's other um you know, other situations, even in civilian life that are a little different. <laughs> um, so the other thing I wanted to ask you, and I, I didn't prep you for this question, so I don't know if it's something you would know, but mm -hmm. do you know any statistics about men in the military that actually, are... yes, um, mm -hmm. they, I did, uh, it said that 1.5% of male service members have experienced unwanted sexual contact in some way. So, um, yeah, I did um, research that as well. So it happens to men, but I think the issue is where the statistics are, I don't think, um, in my opinion, mm -hmm. I don't believe they are as accurate because, you know, when it happens to a man, men are not more inclined to, to speak. It's a hard thing for a woman, yes, but um, you know, especially in the military, you're supposed to be this manly man, and you know, carrying a gun and protecting the um, the America, and then you go and tell that this happened to you. So it's a lot of things that men go through. So there aren't many men that will speak up. Right. So even with that, one point five percent of all the military—that's a lot. It is a um and um and of that it's uh the most is the, in the navy um uh, the statistics that i found um it's the it's a from a an uh an article from the pentagon um and it says that it's the navy has the highest rate and the marine corps well i take that back it's the Marine Corps who has the highest rate of reports and the Navy is close in second. Okay. Yeah. And then, I mean, the Marine Corps is part of the Navy. So exactly you know, for anyone who doesn't know that. Right. right. Um, I wonder if, you know, is, is there anything being done or that has changed over the years in the military about having conversations about this or, or ways to report it confidentially or are there rules around those kinds of things that are taking steps to do something about this or what do you, what do you see i know from my experience it was very difficult because you're supposed to follow the chain of command and now so how do you deal with that when the person who has assaulted you is part of your chain of command and even when there are rules when you are um, going up the chain of command that if you don't want to speak to your direct superior about it, you mm -hmm. still have to tell them what it is. Mm -hmm. Even if it's you want to jump that person, you still have to report it to them. So it becomes a difficult thing. So for me, it was, it was those thoughts in my head. Mm -hmm. In current times, there, um, they passed a bill um, with uh, what is Vanessa Gullian, G Gillian. Mm -hmm. um, they passed a bill, and where, when there's an investigation done, the chain of command is no longer in play, so it can be reported directly. They have they're supposed to have um, a sexual harassment and sexual assault uh, report number that you can call directly to. Um, and make these reports and you don't have to go through your chain of command. Um, how effective that is, I don't know. Um, because I, you know, I got out of the Marine Corps, what, in 1997. So that's a lot of years. So, um, but, um, but I'm, 
they're trying to make change. Mm -hmm. But at times I believe that it's not enough um, because they do do these talks where they tell them, you're not supposed to do this. You're not supposed to talk to this girl this way, or you're not supposed to ogle. You're not supposed to, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the list, you know, but they don't foster the um, confidence in women knowing that if they feel a certain way, they can speak up because it, it battle it goes against everything they teach us as it, you know being a military member. It goes against it, so it's, I think it's very difficult. Um, yeah. Maybe I don't know. Maybe the the solution could be doing a better, thorough psychological evaluation of the people that enter the military. I mean, they do it in the police department, so why not do it with the military? Um, and then maybe they can find the people that are more inclined to do these types of things before right. it happens. Yeah, and I, I wanna mention something just to anybody who's watching this video, because I know from talking with Jeanette and, and reading some things she's written, how she respects the Marines and how she's proud yeah. of her service and how we all, why am I getting so emotional? Um, <laughs> how we all appreciate our military and their service. And this is by no means trying to, to no. um, be negative about any of that, but we, no, not at all. we're here to talk about how it affects you as a person mm -hmm. and what you've gone through and how you've overcome and how you have found healthy coping mechanisms or a road, you know, to a better place. Right. Because of all of this. And that's really the heart of what we're talking about here. And yeah. so I know, you know, Jeanette has a new book out. I don't, I, it might be out for a, a bit. You have to say yeah. when, when it came out. Um, it came but, out on um, October 1st of this year. Awesome. Yes. And so I will, I want you to tell everybody about your book and why you wrote it and, and what it's about and what can, what they learn, what they can learn from it. I can't speak today. <laughs> <laughs> well, my book is called um, Camouflage Shame, The Path to Redemption After Military Sexual Trauma. Um, and the book is well, the reason why I wrote the book was, um, this was a book that was in my head for years. And um, I wanted to write it, but I had all these fears and these doubts and, you know, you do all this what ifs in your head of, oh my goodness, if I talk about this, then what if this and what if that and the shame of it all. And, um, and I went through therapy um, for many years and um, by the grace of God, my most recent therapist, um, Dr. Jimenez, um, she really gave me the tools to help compartmentalize and be able to speak about it and not let it consume me. Um, because it, it became a job to, to, you know, go through life and process it. And every day, everything was a reminder, a smell, a sight, a sound, a song, you know, it, it, it was crazy. Um, but when I decided about four years ago, I was like, you know what, I'm going to write this book I, <laughs> before I'm too old to remember, <laughs> I'm going to write this book. And I've always been a writer. And so I had um, journals. So that kind of helped put some things together because in the journals is where I got the, the emotion that I felt at that time because I've pushed that and processed through that. So I don't have, you know, from that time, I, I processed through it. So I don't feel as intense. And in writing the book, I wanted people to understand that is something that happens and then we have to live with it every day. It becomes a part of who we are, but it doesn't have to be so overpowering that it stops you from living. Mm -hmm. And um, so in the book, I talk about what happened and um, where I wanted to focus more on is um, one, 
I wanted to speak on some of the things that made me specifically more, I believe, more susceptible to this because of my upbringing and, um, and sadly, you know, my upbringing, I think, contributed to me being more susceptible because I endured certain things growing up um, and my own traumas. And they weren't sexually related, but it was just about, you know, my self-esteem and, and not feeling empowered as a woman. Um, and so I, I wanted to talk about that, and I did in the book. And then I wanted to show that you can overcome it. And yes, it, it's a part of who you are, but it isn't who you are mm -hmm. um, because you're a sum of all these parts and you don't have to allow that to be all of who you are. It doesn't define you. Um, and it made me stronger. Um, raising my boys, I was one parent <laughs> because I have a 29-year-old and a 28-year-old. And the parent that I was with them is a whole lot different than the parent I am with my daughter and looking at her gave me more strength to write the book. Um, and I wanted to share it with other women so that in the hopes that if they read my book, if she's thinking about getting help, she can see, oh, uh, she's been through a lot of stuff and she's made it through. Maybe I can too. And Maybe I, some of the things that I talk about and the different types of therapies that I went through, the ones that worked, the ones that didn't work, because um, I put them all in there, um, they can help somebody else. You know, what helped me doesn't necessarily mean that it helps someone else, but it doesn't hurt to try. And um, I just wanted to talk about it. I believe the more you talk about the things that are done in the dark, the more it's brought to the light and it takes away its power. And um, that is the biggest thing for that. If it just helps one individual, I'll be happy. <laughs> that is that is very true. It is those things that are secret and in the dark and they're the things that eat away at us and mm -hmm. keep us in that shame and guilt pattern and not able to process it and get it out of our head and out of our body as stress. And to, it affects us in so much bigger ways than we understand. Mm -hmm. And if we can talk about it, process it, like figure out what our favorite healthy coping mechanisms are, it really does change your life. Um, and I think, you know, being silent about my own suicide attempt for 23 years was a constant shame and guilt cycle and a constant like people who know me won't understand or they'll judge me or it'll hurt my business or you know all of those thoughts mm -hmm. and I think it's the what you're saying is so true because once I finally had this the opportunity and the time and the will to talk about it journal about it go to therapy get the help I needed to um, at least process it enough to where I could talk about it without crying, right. then it's it's like you said, it's compartmentalized and it's a whole different situation. Mm -hmm. And you can use that to help other people, which right. is the whole reason I even have this nonprofit. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm really glad that people are getting to hear your story because it's, it's something that I'm sure is not talked about, like you said, even more mm -hmm. in the military. And- mm -hmm. It's something that we need to we need to talk about, even if we're not out there lobbying for some change. We're right. at least helping ourselves heal, and mm -hmm. I think it's it's really really important. The other thing I want to say is it's it what you said about your book really goes along with the same thing about our scars to stars books, mm -hmm. and the people who tell their stories there are saying, you know, it's you think, oh yes, I'm going to write my story to help other people. But writing your story helps you so much. Mm -hmm. You don't realize it until you do it, but it will. And at the end of the event today, we're going to talk about how you can apply to, to tell your story in one of our books. And, and Jeanette and I have talked about her doing it one. So yeah. we'll see if that, if that can come to fruition, but I think it's a, 
it's also a good experience because we do it as a group and it's a kind of a course that we go through together and we have weekly calls and we get to get to build this support system around ourselves with these people and we have a bond forever because we've been in this mm-hmm. book together. So right. it's really cool. Um but I want to ask if you have like since you've put your book out, like have you gotten a lot of feedback? Have you have you talked to people that maybe you wouldn't have met otherwise? Like what does that look like? Um yes. Um I I have uh it has humbled me because I wrote this little book about me and, you know, I'm not, a, you know, some superstar basketball player or movie star. Um, I'm just a regular person. And I didn't think this quickly that I would get some of the responses that I've gotten. Um, I've even had a family member send me a message and apologize to me. Ooh. <laughs> um, for not seeing the signs of the things that I suffered as a child. And, um, you know, it, it wasn't that family, family members fault. I don't blame them. Um, because as a child, I learned to camouflage my pain. And so I learned from a young age to hide it and not tell. So I, I didn't want anyone to, to feel responsible. I just wanted to get my story told. I want my voice to be heard. And um, I have met some other uh, female veterans. Uh, one in particular, she um, contacted me and told me that it felt like she was reading her life and thanked me for writing the book. Um, And it just gives me goosebumps because that's all I wanted is to give someone hope because it's not going to make what happened go away. It never goes away. Um, It doesn't, but you can thrive and you can be happy in your life and you can have a functional loving relationship with the people around you. Um, and you can live and you can get your joy back. Um, and, and I'm seeing that there's people that are reaching out to me and telling me that, um, even one of my siblings was, she called and said, all she could say was, wow. Um, I'm the oldest, uh, and I have seven siblings and she, (laughs) my sister, she just said, all I can say is wow, because I didn't speak about this. I, I kind of let them know that something happened to me, but I never was really specific. I didn't. So them reading the book is getting the insight to my mind of, oh my God, this is what really happened to her. They kind of knew, but not really, you know? Um, And so, yeah, um, I just hope that, you know, it it helps. That's the only thing that I want from it is to help women know that there is hope. You can, you can. (laughs) (laughs) I know, I can never get through these events without crying. (laughs) No, I think it's, but it's good tears because, Mm -hmm. you know, like I said, like we, that the writing process helps us and then it helps others. And it's like, it's really a full circle approach in my mind to healing. And Mm -hmm. um, I mean, almost everybody who's written in one of our books has, has said that. Um, And our videos Mm -hmm. are on YouTube, so you can watch it. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, it was it was very healing for me. It, the process was long and hard, and I had to do a lot of self reflection in writing the book because there are things about me that I'm not proud of either. Um, but if I'm going to be truthful and honest and raw about what others did to me from my perspective, I had to be honest and truthful about 
the role I played in everything. And so the good and the bad, and I just put it on the page. I just let it be what it is so that my truth can be told. Yes. I'm very glad that you did. And I think it, it is, it is really you. hard. And then once it's out there, it's kind of like, well, I did this hard thing and I was super vulnerable and I, you know, showed my authenticity and now it's out in the world and there's nothing I can do about it. So now right. it's like, <laughs> okay, let's see what comes of it and who right. can help. And, and what, you know, once you, once you do that, it's really, you know, it's out there. Mm -hmm. So I'm really glad that you did. Yeah. And, um, what I, I haven't finished the book yet, but what I've read has been really incredible. So I hope people will will read it. And I would like to put your website up here. It's your name, so you can mm -hmm. tell people what when they go to this website, what do they find? Well, um, it it talks about who I am, um, and it also gives some excerpts of the book, um, and then you have a. Uh, there's links to um, purchasing the book if you are interested in purchasing the book. Mm -hmm. And um, you can also write um, posts because I also blog on there. I started blogging about um, different issues. I also um, give resources. I post some resources for anyone, man or woman, military related um, veteran resources from organizations that help. Um, and locally, there's a lot of good organizations. And I am so grateful for some of these organizations that helped me along the way to get to where I am right now. Um, and it, it, I just wanted to share, like, it, this information is not just easily accessible. And um, I know it worked for me. And so I just want to pay it forward and share it with others so that then perhaps it'll lead them on their path to healing. Mm -hmm. It's true. I think it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's always like, there's so much information out there. Right. And, and right. it's <laughs> like, if you know what you're looking for, sometimes it's easy to find, but also you don't know what you don't know about what's, what resources are available. And we have a, we have a resource page on our website too, with, with some partner organizations we've worked with. And then, um, you know, we would love to find a way or have you just you know, people can post things on our public Facebook page for the Realize Foundation or mm -hmm. LinkedIn or Instagram. So mm -hmm. if anybody is hearing this and they have resources for anything, you're welcome to post them on our site. And, you know, our mission is to reduce suicide rates through conversations, community and personal story. So our focus is these virtual events where people can connect. And our other mission is our books that we publish with people's story. So mm -hmm. those are our main avenues of getting the community together and helping people tell their story and, you know, getting it out there. So like for me being silent for 23 years and you being silent for so long, if we could have picked up a book and read that someone else had gone through something similar, we mm -hmm. probably would have reached out to that person, but right. we weren't ready to tell the world. Mm -hmm. So that is kind of the the point of your book and our books is like have someone pick it up, read it, understand, hey, this person might could help me or mentor me right. or and just alone. have a conversation with right. me, you know, right. or any of those things. So thank right. you so much for being here and for having this conversation with me. Thank you for having me. Um, I, I think it's really important because like you said about the um, suicide um, suicide rates is also another statistics that real that's really high among um, the men and women that have been sexually assaulted um, in the military. Um, so it's an epidemic, um, and we need to do something and speak up. So um, I really, really am blessed to have met you during this process, um, and I appreciate you. <laughs> Well, I feel the same. And I, I want to thank our friend Pam that introduced right. me to you. Um, <laughs> thank you, Pam. <laughs> and Pam has been involved in some of our events in the past, too. And she's 
I haven't met Pam in person, but she lives somewhere I used to live and she goes to the church I used to go to. And mm-hmm. that's kind of how we how we met um, right. online. But I think it's it, it is really important. Veteran suicide in general is such a problem. Um, and we have a couple organizations we've been working with on some level um, and would would be happy to do more. We've talked about doing so many different things in the veteran world. Um, so if anybody's listening to this and they have an idea or they want to reach out to me, please do so. Um, our website is realizedfoundation.org. And I'm sure you'll see that everywhere in our in our stuff if you're here at our event. Um, we also have a YouTube channel with lots of interviews and stuff like that. So you can you can watch our events and our book launches and all of that. Um, but thank you so much for being here, Jeanette. And I hope to see you at the event, see you in the chat. Um, and and I think we'll have many more conversations. I'm sure we will. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you.